so fed up with, uh, with this process of trying to track them down, we call the police. People do crazy things when they, got, when they get a lot of money, like forty, fifty, hundred thousand dollars $100,000. They say the best things in life are free But you can give them to the birds and bees I need money That's what I want That's what I want That's what I want Hi there, I'm Tom Nachu. Welcome to another edition of Fraud Squad TV. Now, being scammed by an individual or company leaves you feeling angry and hurt, and that's understandable. Many of us keep the incident to ourselves because we're embarrassed. After all, we consider ourselves intelligent enough not to let it happen to us in the first place. However, frauds such as identity theft and bank skimming, well, they can happen to you without you even being aware of it. So you need to protect yourself in advance. Learn from the experts on how to prevent frauds from happening to you in the first place. Stay tuned for this episode's stories and valuable tips. Home improvement fraud is fast becoming a quickly growing fraud. And the reason is more people are buying homes, not just for principal residences, but for investment properties and recreational properties as well. The Consumer Protection Division of the Ontario Ministry of Government Services reports that there's an average of 3,000 complaints from homeowners against contractors every year. The vast majority of these complaints are for deposits made and work never done. Now, in this story, we'll see how two separate victims were taken by serial fraudsters in Peterborough, Ontario, and how it nearly drove them crazy. Being new to Peterborough, we really didn't know any pavers. Uh, we went to the Yellow Pages. Well, it came as quite a surprise when Norm Smith was visited by Ben Hatton, a member of the reputable and successful Hatton family, and offered an amazing deal to pave his driveway. A very pleasant uh, fellow, uh, very sociable, very personable. Uh, didn't seem to be anything wrong that we could see. Uh, now, of course, we were new to Peterborough, but we were kind of caught in this... You know, people in Peterborough were nice after 30 years in Toronto and, and dealing with Toronto. Not that Toronto's not nice, but Peterborough is a very friendly place, so this just seemed to be very natural. Quoted the price, uh, but part of uh, his uh, demand was that $1,000 were to be given to him up front for materials and paying off some labor costs, etc. Um, so. I mean, he, he just, this was part of his contract and said, there's no negotiation on this, uh, so that's the way it is. A person portraying to be a legitimate contractor may attend your house. They may, may give you an, a quote to, in order to perform some work. Uh, and the usual course of business is for the homeowner to provide a down payment to the contractor, uh, which is anywhere between 10 and 25% of the total cost of the job. He came in about mid-September and excavated our driveway because they have to dig down so that they can put the materials to compact it, etc., etc. And on that day, I was here and uh, we gave him the check for $1,000 because he had to pay the excavator and, and get materials. Well, it turns out that was the last time that Norm ever saw the fraudulent paver. And like so many victims of fraud, he didn't believe it had happened to him. We called him, we left uh, messages for him, uh, we got no response. We actually found out where he lived and went down to his house and <laughs> knocked on the door, knocked on the windows. Uh, whether he was there or not was debatable. We felt he was, but we didn't see Ben. We didn't uh, hear from him. We didn't see him at all. So finally, I think it was October the 20th, we just had had our fill of this. We wrote him uh, a letter basically saying, look, here's what's happened, you're not responding, uh, this is unacceptable, let us know, I want to know, or we want to know tomorrow, uh, the 21st, what you're going to do to correct it and fix it. 21st came, nothing, Ben was nowhere to be seen, at that point we were just so fed up with, uh, with this process of trying to track him down, we called the police. And the police came over, interviewed us, uh, kind of let us know at the time that we weren't the only ones, let's say, who were uh, in the same predicament with Ben, and that they now had 
probably enough evidence to charge him with fraud, which eventually they did. The good news is the police made their arrest and Norm got his money back. Now, just around the corner from Norm, another victim of driveway scamming, Charlotte M tells her story. He wrote up the quote, which was $1,800, and so I said, certainly, we'll go ahead with it. And he said, I need to receive half of that amount um, in payment so I can do some purchasing, which I thought is, is fair for a young fellow. So I wrote him a check, and off he went. And so then I didn't see him for a few weeks, and I phoned and left a message. Well, there was no response. Then I saw him one day. I was in the bank in the lineup, and he was ahead of me. And I said, Ben, I said, are you going to be coming to do my driveway soon? Because it had been probably a month and a half after. And he said, oh, I'm so busy. I've been working in Toronto and doing a lot of work that way. So I said, fine, but I would appreciate you arriving soon. So then nothing happened, nothing happened. And then I talked to Steve Bell, who has Bell's Paving, very honest fellow. So I phoned him and I said, Steve, do you know this Ben Hatton? What's happening? And he said, oh, no, not you too. And when I heard that he was doing it all around the city and very elderly people, that was very upsetting. And I just thought, how could someone do that? We're with Craig Hannaford from Hannaford Partners, our fraud expert. You know, there's a very little time and a lot to do in the house. Why do I have to get three estimates for everything I do? Well, you really should get three estimates. And the reason is you want to make sure that the price is competitive and you want to shop it around. That's just being a smart consumer. Isn't it also being a smart consumer when somebody's just down the road paving something? I mean, maybe he does have some, you know, extra materials and maybe I can get a good deal. Well, that's one of the, you know, the, that's one of the scams where people come up to you and say, I just happen to be doing a house down the street and I have some extra materials and I can give you a great deal. Take the person's name, take the company name, but still get references. I've got to run home and check on the roof. If you've got a home, Craig's probably got your attention. Stand by, he's got even more tips. Stand by, we'll be right back with more Fraud Squad TV. A bigger house, a nicer car, even a trip somewhere nice. Well, there's no doubt about it. We'd all jump at the chance to make more money and be able to buy more things for ourselves. And that's where pyramid scheme investments come in. They promise you just that, a large financial reward by enrolling other people to join. It sounds completely simple. Now, they may be disguised as investments, games, chain letters, charities, or motivational companies, but no matter what face they put on, pyramid schemes are illegal, and you could end up losing your savings or even the ones you love. Take a look at this story. It's hard to explain, but there's a real euphoria in town. Like, people do crazy things when they, got, when they get a lot of money, like forty, fifty, hundred thousand dollars $100,000, tax-free. David Thornton lived in a small town in Ontario, Canada with his wife and near his siblings. Now, David said that he always felt like a significant member of the community. We had one of the largest businesses in our town and everyone knew me and, and my wife and uh, they knew me from other things that I had done, uh, you know, raising funds uh, for people. Suddenly things were changing that I couldn't put my finger on. David said his suspicions were heightened all the more when his wife started acting differently too. She was on a high, somehow elevated, and now very carefree about spending money. One day she threw me the keys to an almost new car and said, well, don't worry about it. And I said, well, I thought we were doing well, but I didn't feel that, you know, being in a small town, we needed the car, we didn't use it that much. Not something expensive. She said, don't worry about it. So we were in a restaurant and she took a panic attack. I'd never seen a panic attack. I thought she was having a heart attack.
I left pretty well the business up to my wife. I was busy building the, the business. It was a huge business. I spent 10 years physically building it. But the stress his wife was under was about something much, much bigger, according to David. Something that had swept through the entire town. And panic attacks were just the beginning. She had mentioned it about, I think it was the year before. And I said, oh, those are pyramid schemes. And uh, I explained it to her, and she tried to explain to me that no, you could get any different levels. It was to help women. And I remember the conversation we had, and I had said to her, no, these break down. And, and if it's supposed to help women who are being abused by their husbands, when the husband finds out that they put $5,000 on their credit card and they have nothing to show for it, they're going to be in worse trouble than they were before. One of the things that you'll see with pyramid schemes, uh, because they've been around for so long, is they always have to have a new angle. And so oftentimes the angle is um, directed at a certain group or a certain population. And they were basically told, don't tell your husband about it. David tells us his wife became one of the major recruiters. She is one of the members at the top of the pyramid, bringing in money for every one that she brought in afterward. Eventually, it started to come out, and they couldn't contain it anymore. So the authorities knew they had to do something. And so they started uh, going around a province, and the worst thing was that they were selectively prosecuting people and trying to keep the thing uh, downplayed as much as they could. The hardest thing for me is that I was in that town for about a year and a half, and nobody ever came to me and said, Dave, you know, we know you're a pretty good guy, but your wife took us for $5,000. Nobody spoke out. I, this is the thing that really bothers me. That's why I keep fighting it. And the one person that made the most money, they made her citizen of the year. Pyramid schemes go under many different names. Most of them have exactly the same structure. Robert Fitzpatrick knows all too well about the pyramid scheme dynamic. About 20 years ago while living in Florida, Robert himself was approached by a group of friends to join a pyramid. He was told he would make a lot of money quickly and easily. And so he invested. The object is to recruit more people below you so you can move up the chain where you can receive the money. Now, why is that a fraud? Because it is an untenable, impossible system for continuing. You cannot endlessly expand. If you had five in the scheme and the five were told to get five each, which would be 25, and the 25 did the same, 125, you could only go 13 levels and you would surpass the population of the Earth. Five to the 13th power is over six billion. Robert spent many years researching and writing, and then wrote a book on pyramid schemes and how they affect those who join, their families and their friendships. The factor of denial is tremendous in these because people invest their most basic hopes and dreams in the outcome that they have been promised will occur. When it doesn't occur or when somebody brings up the truth of it that it won't occur, they go into extreme denial and they want to get that other person out of their life, and this can cause the end of a marriage, end of a friendship, family can be disrupted this way. This happened to David Thornton. It's not uncommon. So I didn't know any of this was going on. So I put it together that she then decided to be, you know, 20 years of marriage and she was just gonna give it up. And, and that's the choices people make, which is, you know, it's sad. But also, she was under a great deal of pressure from you know, the people that got her into it. Human nature is such that we want to find the good in people, particularly people that are like us. And so I think it's all the more easy to get lured in to that kind of a scheme, and you have to be particularly vigilant about that. And as for David's wife, well, she didn't lose any money in the scam, but she did lose her marriage over it. And according to David, she put herself through a tremendous amount of stress and worry. I see all these lives that are destroyed. Like it, they wrecked our whole town. And my wife, I don't know how, how she's doing, but 
We're here with Craig Hannaford, our fraud expert. Everybody wants to make a good investment. Everybody wants to stay on the straight and narrow. How do I know the difference between a pyramid scheme and something that's totally legit? Well, it can be challenging. That's why I tell everybody, before they get involved in any type of selling scheme like that, you really should check it out. Check, it out. check out the people behind it. Go to the state uh, consumer agency, see whether this company is legit on the level. Do your own research on the internet to see if there's been any complaints about this particular uh, marketing plan. Almost every night of the week at some hotel somewhere, there's a, a multi-level marketing meeting. Different products, different types of organizations. How do I know that it is a multi-level marketing company which is legit or a pyramid scheme which isn't? Well, once again, you got to check your uh, local uh, uh, regulatory agency because they may have complaints on a particular uh, company. That's and a good point. you know, and if they do have complaints, that's a big warning sign, stay away. There's lots of other opportunities out there. You don't need to get involved in a company that right. consumers are already mad at them. Yeah, that's right. If there's not you're going to not make this meeting this Tuesday night, there'll be another one next Tuesday Absolutely. night. Absolutely. Well, I know that makes you curious, so stand by. Craig's got some more tips on how to prevent this type of fraud from happening to you. More Fraud Squad TV after these messages. Hi, I'm Naomi Joy. Have you ever thought about how often you are asked for your personal information? Like when you're paying for something in a store and the clerk asks for your telephone number or address? Once you give out this information, you no longer have control over its use. And here's the really scary part. Almost 30% of the time, fraudsters get your information from stealing this data. If you read the papers or watch the news, you know it happens. Protecting your personal information should become an automatic response. So when anyone asks you for your personal information, question them as to why they need it and what it will be used for. If you don't think it's for a good reason or you can't be sure that it's the only way they will use it, don't give it out. You may not always be able to stop someone from stealing data, but you can limit who you give your information to. Now, Fraud Squad TV takes it to the street to hear more ways fraudsters try to get your money. Uh, my story is that uh, someone tapped into my phone lines and uh, through the computer and uh, they billed some phone charges to another country. Big bill, $230. I don't really know, using some sniffers and routers, they can go in, find your IP address, uh, tap into your line, and then they use your line to make phone calls. I called uh, my service provider and said, this is not my bill, I don't know anyone in these parts of the world, and uh, refused to pay the bill. I was exonerated and it never, ha never did happen since. In fact, what I did is I purchased a Mac. I was using a PC and, uh, yeah, never had a problem with a Macintosh. Yeah, buy a Mac. I don't know. That's all I can really say. Yeah. My story is I rented um, a house and there was a guy living in the basement and we hooked up the cable and I have two little girls, twin girls, and they were I think six or seven at the time. And all of a sudden <laughs> calls me and tells me that I've racked up $1,200 worth of porno charges and that they're going to cancel my cable. So it turns out that the guy downstairs between like 2 a.m. and 6 a.m. was totally ordering up all this porno, but he was linked into my digital box. So I got a bill for $1,200. When you install cable in a house and some of the floors are being rented out to other people to make sure that there's no way that they're being spliced. In 2004, I decided to come and live in this country. So I get here, opened up a bank account, tried to get a good job. And when I went to my credit, my credit was all ruined. And I'm like, how can it be ruined if I never lived here? Unfortunately, someone got a hold of my name and of my ID. I don't know how they did it, but the truth is that my credit was really, really bad, dude. To get over this, I had to get a whole bunch of papers, I had to get proof that I wasn't living here in the country, and it did take me a long time to fix my credit. And that's pretty much my story. Spent the weekend in uh, Phoenix with my girlfriend, and when I got back, the first thing I did was check my email, and there was an email from Visa USA saying that there had been some, uh, some weird dealings with my credit card, and it, I just got back from the U.S., so it made sense that they would contact me. Uh, they asked me to click a link and to put all my, my personal vital information in there uh, to verify that it was me or else they were going to cancel my card. So I hit the link, 
uh, beautiful visa website came up and uh, something just kind of rubbed me the wrong way. It was asking for my social insurance number and things like that. So I decided to call instead to talk to somebody and they told me that they don't usually send emails that, and uh, they started asking me some reverse questions and then once they did they said I was almost the victim of a scam. They were going to uh, take all my information and then use it for you know, to apply for other credit cards or whatever they were going to do but I did the right thing anyway. Just any kind of email regarding personal information. Don't give your personal information on the internet. If uh, you get a call from a credit card company just call them. Make sure you talk to somebody. Call the number on your credit card. Check with them first. It seems to be very important. Thank you for sharing your stories. By telling your stories, we might just prevent someone else from falling for the same scam. If you want to learn more about protecting yourself from fraud, or if you have a story to share, visit our website at fraudsquadtv.com. Let's fight fraud together. Well, we've come to the end of another episode of Fraud Squad TV. If you're interested in the stories that you've just seen, you can get more information from fraudsquadtv.com. Feel free to join our community because we'd love to have you there. Remember, we're all fighting fraud together. <laughs>